Hello, welcome to the May 12th, 2023 Club Cubase live stream. My name is Greg Undo and I'm the host of the live stream. If you have not attended a live stream before, how it works is you can submit questions in advance by sending them to clubcubase at steinberg.de or just simply ask questions in the chat field uh, and we'll go through the chat, the questions asked in the chat chronologically. So, uh, and realize that as the live stream continues to go on that I won't be able to answer questions in a real time manner. So it could be 20 to 30 minutes by the time I get to a particular question, but if we could try to avoid repeating the same question over and over again, that would be appreciated. Uh, when asking questions, if you could specify which version of Cubase, so uh, whether it's Cubase, LE, AI, Elements, Artist, or Pro, what version number, such as 10, 10.5, 11, or 12, as well as which operating system, that information will be helpful. Um, and uh, when asking questions, we should have all of the topics that are covered in today's live stream pinned to the top of the comments field several hours after the live stream. I have to go back and rewatch the live stream after a quick dinner break and, and put all the timestamps so you could easily navigate. And if you wanted to search for particular uh, questions that have been covered in previous live streams, we've covered over 25,000 different topics. You could go to cubaseindex.com and Jan from Stockholm has been kind enough to create that website. Uh, so we want to give a special thanks to Jan. We also want to give a special thanks to Jazz Dude and Agent K who serve as moderators. They're not Steinberg employees, they just do it to make it a better community. So special thanks to them. And also another wonderful resource of information that's available to the Steinberg community is the Cubase Nation Discord, and Jazdu does a lot of work with that. Um, so it's a wonderful resource of information. Um, so once again, my name is Greg Undo. I work for Yamaha Corporation of America. I focus primarily uh, on Steinberg products, and I'm the host of the live stream. I'm presenting from outside of Washington, D.C. area in Alexandria, Virginia. If you are watching this live, uh, please feel free to uh, introduce yourself and tell us where you're from. Uh, I apologize for any confusion with Tuesday's live stream. I had uh, my IT department when I was switching over my login password. It kind of messed up and I got locked out of my computer after Friday's live stream. So I had to ship it overnight to California. Uh, and then I was hoping to get it back for Tuesday morning, uh, but it was delayed because of weather, so I didn't have my computer, so I apologize for that. Uh, but let's go ahead and get started. Let's see, we have some questions. All right, so we see Benny from Sweden. Uh, he can't join us today, but he's just kind of logged in to say hi. We see Jan from Cubase Index. Uh, from Stockholm. Thanks for joining us. We have Uno Memento from Finland. We have Jason Sykes from South Shields, England. We have John Barry from the English Riviera in Old England. Okay, uh, so we have a first question from Dallas LaRue. Uh, I bought and, and installed Spectral Layers Pro 9, but when I open it, it comes up Spectral Layers 1. I don't know how to activate it. It doesn't show up in my Steinberg activation manager so as soon as you get uh the spectral layers which is currently on sale for the spring promotion uh let's say if you go to the steinberg download assistant what you want to do is you probably got a d a, like a download access code so i'll just go to open up uh this so the easiest way to do this and we'll just get this program open is you'll just simply go to the download access code. All right, and this will be kind of, uh, once you start this, this will be kind of logged uh, into your particular account. So into your My Steinberg account, you can see your sign in credentials here when you go to My Account. And then you'll see just in the upper uh, upper left hand corner where you enter your download access code you should be able to at this point uh, you know enter in your download access code and then at that point run the installation and it will automatically activate it for you so make sure that you've entered in the download access code before installation, but you could enter in the uh, 
then you'll see it ref once that's done and this is tied into your account. Uh, when you go to the activation manager, you should see uh, the activation here. So you should see, okay, Spectralers Pro 9 activated. If you see, see to the point where, you know, you see this red and you could just activate it there directly in the Steinberg activation manager as well. So make sure that you do that. And then once you have the program activated at that point, uh, since it's under new Steinberg licensing, when you go to the Spectral Layers extension, it will launch uh, the Cubase Pro as a, or Spectral Layers Pro as opposed to Spectral Layers 1, which is part of the Cubase license. All right, so we have Mark uh, Isper from Moldova. Thanks for joining us. We have Parabot 2 on. Uh, so we see... Paulus the web gnome. Hi, Greg. Are you okay? Yeah, I'm doing great. I just it was locked out of my computer. It was kind of annoying. Okay. Uh, so we see Best Korean Jesus uh, says, when dissolving drums, my fills don't fill the whole range. Is there a configuration to set it to have them all be the same length? Okay. So let's say if I am in this project here so I'll just go to my patterns all right and let's say I have a fill okay so I think that when we go to uh, dissolve pattern so let's say we go to MIDI and let's choose dissolve part um, so we see separate pitches, and I think if we choose to not, if we uncheck optimized display, so we'll come over here, uh, we'll process that, that they will all be the same length, uh, regardless of what you actually have. So try again when you go to MIDI to dissolve part, that uh, optimized display, try to uncheck that, and then I think they'll all show up as the same length. All right, so we see Jan giving kudos to Jazz Dude for the super Cubase form, the unofficial Cubase Nation Discord. All right, so wonderful to see Soren on the live stream. All right, so we see, uh, I understand how sidechain compression works, but how does sidechain delay work, for example, on vocal delay throws? So often what you could do is set up a um, just a delay so that when there's no, you, w what a sidechain delay will do is when there's no words, like let's say when there's no vocals coming in, that, you know, as soon as it stops, then the delay will kick in. Um, so that's kind of, so it's, the delay isn't going on while, um, um you know, so the delay isn't going on while the singing is going, but if there's a pause in the vocal that you could just simply do, <clears throat> you know, a delay during the pause and not when the vocalist is actually singing. If you want to do just like a, um, you know, it's not necessarily often used for uh, doing, um, you know, doing like uh, delay throws. If you wanted to do something for like delay throws, let's say I'll just take this and let me just bounce selection. And we'll create kind of one audio part. So if we had just um, our vocal here, so let's say. I feel the way. So if I wanted to do just like a vocal, like a delay and uh, delay throws, um, I could just simply come come over here and say, okay, I just want to take this last word, and I just wanted to select that with my range tool. And then if you get an audio to plugins, and we'll just say, okay, let's come over here, just just do a mono delay, and I want that to be quarter notes. That now as we listen to it. I feel the way. So you could just do it like that. So that's often kind of the best way of doing it. 
But if you have a side chain on a delay, like when there's the delay will only come in when there's actual no audio <clears throat> that's feeding, that's being sung at that particular time, then the delay could come in and kind of fill that in. So. All right, so we have uh, Ulysses Montavani checking in from Brazil. Thanks for joining us. All right, we have Pete Saint joining from Amsterdam. We have Arnold uh, from Southern Germany. Thanks for being on the live stream today. All right, so we have Capital Razor saying special thanks to you, Greg. Thanks for being on. We have Lawrence Koch checking in from Rhode Island. Great to see you on, Lawrence. And we have Gareth on early, so that's wonderful. All right, so we have, uh, I just see Cubase Beta 13. So I don't know anything about it so that I could talk about. All right, uh, so Gareth is saying hello from Elysium. And Gareth is saying Greg had an argument with his Mac. So, yeah, I wasn't happy with it Friday. So, But at least I didn't have my Mac shut down before Friday's live stream. So that's what I was really worried about. Um, all right, wonderful to see the illustrious Kerwin Young finally has a day available to view to view the live stream in full. In full, so he's glad to be here, everyone. And Kerwin's in Atlanta. Everyone, Google Kerwin Young. He's a very interesting, interesting person. All right. All right, so best screen Jesus, uh, just uh, after a question with the drums, it just says, I thought Optimize was performance related. Thank you so much. All right. All right, so we have uh, Westar. Westar just says, love the streams. Hi, everyone. Thanks for being a part of the live stream today. <clears throat> All right, so we have uh, Pete asks, um, uh, hi, Greg. In one of my projects, the core track doesn't follow the adjustments I do in the tempo track. What am I doing wrong? Thanks. Okay, so let's say we have a chord track here. Um, all right, so let's say we have a chord track, uh, and my tempo is set to 100 beats a minute. Uh, and let's say I adjust my tempo upwards. Um, you can see that my chord track is, my chord data is staying in the same bar and beat position. And this could be if you right click, um, let's see if it's visible here. Um, you'll see like this, you could take the chord track itself and put it, it's probably in linear mode. So now as I adjust the tempo, we'll see that as we do the tempo changes, these will get to be slightly off the grid. So if it's not following the uh, chord changes, what you probably need to do is to come over here and make sure that the track itself is in musical mode. So now when I adjust it this way, as I adjust the tempo, the chord tracks, the chord, uh, the chords in the chord track are staying at the bar and beat position as opposed to the actual time position. So we could just kind of come over here. So probably just click on this little icon, select the chord track, and make sure that it looks like a quarter note as opposed to a clock. And then, then you should have the chord track automatically stay in the bar and beat position as you adjust tempo positions once the track is in musical mode. Wonderful to see John Costigan on the live stream. All right. Um, so we have a question from Mfo T T G. Uh, it says, "Hi, I'm Mfo from Malawi. Uh, I'm a producer and beginner level. My problem in Cubase 10 is that when I put reverb and delay in sends, it adds a lot of echoes. Like I've put a lot of delay. <clears throat> All right. So let's say if we wanted to do this, 
So it could depend on, you know, like settings within the delay. So let's say if we were playing back our vocal here. All right, so let me just, um, I'll just solo this and take it out of loop. All right, so let's say if I, I'm going to come over to uh, my sends and I want... So right now I have a, an, a reverb, but I'm going to add a delay. So I'm going to right click in the sends where we'll add a delay send. So let's come over to delay and I'll just put a mono delay. All right. So let's say I want this to be like a dotted quarter note delay. So as we listen to it now, we go to our track. Na, 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 na. So if you wanted like fewer delays, you could just adjust the feedback. What dimension am I in? So or if you wanted to add the feedback up, this could add more. So usually on your delay parameter, just adjust the feedback down. So you're going to have like one delay, the initial delay. And then, so, you know, try adjusting your feedback parameter on your delay. And that will probably cut down on the number of delays that happen. So you have fewer delays. So instead of having delays that could go on kind of infinitely you could adjust the amount of how many delays are being adjusted and kind of the same with reverb you know you always kind of use the send level here to, to adjust how much reverb is going out i started losing sight and if you're doing a lot of stuff for vocals maybe start you know some people start with hall as a reverb and that may be more applicable for orchestral instruments and voices a good place to start is maybe like a plate preset um and that will probably get you going so all right all right so we have pz136 just think super friday All right, so we see Rob G. Uh, hi, is it possible to copy the MIDI from uh, from of an instrument from one project to another? So I think there's a couple ways to do it. One is, let's say, if I have a new project open. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'll just come over here. Let's do create empty. All right, so let's say if I am, this is my empty project. Um, I'm gonna just select MIDI event here, and you could just drag and drop MIDI in. Um, and let's see if we copy from here and move my cursor directly here and paste so just command c <clears throat> control or let me just control control c or command c and control or command v to copy and paste uh, you could also just come over to uh, we'll say let's import tracks from project and then you could select a particular project so let's say okay i wanted to Come over to Step Designer, like this project, and then you could import instrument tracks directly from there. So there's kind of three different ways to quickly uh, access uh, and copy MIDI parts from one from one project to another. So let me know if that's helpful for you. Just activate this project again. Okay. Um, 
So we see from uh, Kuz Kuz, uh, hello, how can I activate the CC channel on a MIDI event without hardware, for example, CC20? So I'm not sure if you want to just kind of draw in CC20, but if you wanted to, you could, uh, let's go to our editor and then we'll go into our MIDI CC list. And so if you don't see it, um, you know, activate it, if you don't see it here, um, we'll just go to, set up available controllers. So let's say, okay, I want to do CC20. So if this isn't in the common list, I'm going to, so again, just uh, go down into controller lane <clears throat> and say, set up available controllers, select the controller you want. Let's say controller 20, I'm going to add it. And now when I click here in the controller list, we can just say, I want to see controller 20. <clears throat> and at this point, I could just draw it in within the event, just using normal tools. So give that a try real quick. All right. All right, um, so we see from Anto just asking if chat is on slow mode. So maybe it's my ability to answer the questions in the chat. Uh, but all right, and Anto asks, uh, how can I sign external expression pedal to my mod wheel in a Roland RD 700 SX so I could play hands-free? It's a dedicated MIDI piano. Uh, I am using Cubase 12 Pro. Um, so if you wanted to turn the incoming expression data um, into modulation so that you could have both hands on it, let's go to a MIDI track and we'll go to our input transformer. So we'll see input transformer and what we want to do is to say, okay, I want it maybe at the track level and then let's open the panel. So what we're gonna do is to take the incoming MIDI CC11 and we want to turn that into CC1. So we're gonna say, uh, the first thing we want to do is say, uh, we want to transform and we'll say type is equal to continuous controller, so we're con to controller and we're gonna specify um, and we'll say that value one and let's say is gonna be equal to 11 and that's expression. And what we want to do is to take value one and subtract uh, 10. So we want controller 11 to turn into controller one. So we're gonna take the very first value, the controller type, and now as soon as this is activated, that would turn the, uh, your expression pedal into modulation. Um, so I'll show kind of the opposite. I don't have an expression pedal hooked up currently. So I'm gonna say, let's take, a I wanna turn controller one uh, and I'm gonna add 10. So I'm gonna take my, my uh, modulation and turn that into a uh, controller. So just to show this, I'm gonna to go to my MIDI monitors Okay, and we'll go to under MIDI inserts and we'll see MIDI monitor. And at this point, when this is turned off, I move my modulation wheel. It's now CC1 as expected. So now when I turn this on, it's now turned my modulation wheel into CC11. So if you have the an expression pedal that you want to uh, you know, do modulation, or if you wanted that to do volume, you could say, you know, uh, MIDI CC7 is volume. So you could say incoming MIDI CC11 message, CC11 subtract four. Uh, and that would take 
all the CC11 messages into CC7. So experiment with the input transformer. And again, just come over and say you want to type is equal to controller. MIDI controller is going to be equal, in your case, to controller number 11. We want to subtract 10 and then make sure it's on transform. And you could have this set up on the track for the project or so. So either way. So and you can save it as a preset. So if you need to do that over and over again repeatedly. So let me know if that's helpful. Apparently I'm messing with Gareth's brain. All right. All right, wonderful to see Ted Springman on from Los Angeles area. Uh, hi, Greg, could you talk a little bit about ADR in either Cubase or Nuendo? So uh, Nuendo is really kind of specifically has ADR tool sets. So we'll go ahead and show that. second Let me just check uh, something real quick I may have to So I may have to show that in the next one. I may have to redo my Nuendo license. Sorry about that. Let me just see if I could get it going from here. Okay, sorry, I don't have my, um, unfortunately, I, you know, I could show it, I'll show it for Tuesday's live stream. I apologize for not, let me see if we could get this activated real quick. All right, maybe we'll give it one more shot here. All right, yeah, so I think we're good. Sorry, get this going here. All right, see if there's our question. Um, all right, so we see Avri checking in from Tel Aviv. So let me just get this going here real quick. All 
Okay, so when we do ADR, and ADR stands for like, you know, automated dialogue replacement. And this is often when you see actors that go into a recording studio and re-record all of the lines in a particular, uh, in a, for a particular film or TV show. So we'll just... And Nuendo has some specific tools for this. Okay, so let's say we have, uh, let me open up the video. All right, and let me just check my connections here quickly. Okay, so let's say we wanted to do, like let's say we have this scene coming up in a video here. So let's say right where she says, help me, uh, we want to uh, to come over there and just kind of replace that particular dialogue. Help me. Okay, so what we could do is we'll go to our project menu and let's go to, um, as soon as we come over here to ADR. And then we could base these, like the in and out points based on different uh, marker tracks. So let's say I want to do dialogue and we could have like a different marker track for different, you know, for each character if, if necessary. So as soon as we come over, uh, what we could do now is it's kind of broken down into where we could uh, rehearse, uh, you could record and at that point when we come over and also just to kind of review so we could set up various um you know we could set up like our video so if we wanted to do like a swipe um or if we wanted to do like counter counting down from three to one if we wanted to do different routing for headphones uh so if they wanted to hear uh, all the M&E tracks, like music and effects. So let's, again, I'll just come over here. So let's say if we have just tons of dialogue, I would go to this particular one and we could go ahead and rehearse this. So we see this green arrow, we see kind of the swipe indicating when the actor would do the particular, would say their line. So let's say, okay, now I wanted to record we see that it's indicated as red and let's review our changes and now we can say let's just jump to a different scene all right someone's going to come in we could have the the actual text like the dialogue we could have that kind of embedded into the particular file as well so if we wanted to show the dialogue as uh, so we can say always show dialogue so as we come over here, so instead of having to set up, you know, very kind of laborious process, this is kind of a purpose built ADR tool. So you can say, okay, we're going to see their video. We see the streamers. Okay. Let's go ahead. Just record that. Let's review it. What you just did. And now at that point, you could just go through thousands of lines of dialogue and have <clears throat> everything kind of automatically uh, just handled in kind of a purpose-built tool for doing dialogue replacement. All right, and that's <clears throat> one of the things that's in Nuendo that's not necessarily inside of Cubase. All right. Okay, so wonderful to see Cap Energy Music on from Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. All right.
Okay, uh, we have a question. Um, <clears throat> how to hear the effect while recording without recording the effect? And it's from Bizad. Um, so w if you are going to record the effect, so let's say if we're on a particular track um, and go to our mixer, we'll have channels that will be our input channels. So where we see the red fader caps. So if we have this input for a track, so let's say if I was recording a guitar and I had the uh, VST amp rack um, and since this is on the input channel this will actually be recorded directly into the signal path so that will be recorded so if it's if you have a track placed on an insert of an input channel that will be embedded if you want to hear the effect but not record it we would then place it onto the audio track itself as an insert. And that way we the track plays back through the insert, but the track itself is, is dry or unaffected. And at that point you could just simply, uh, you know, so, and then that way it's not applied to the particular recording. It's playing the recording through the channel inserts in real time. But if you wanted to embed the effect onto the recording, at that point, you need to put it on the input channel. Now, sometimes you may not hear the effect when you put it, like, as you're recording. Uh, when you go to, let's say, your Audio 01 track and you have, like, let's say, the guitar amp. And while you're recording, you don't hear it, but you hear it on playback. And that could be because when you go into your audio interface that you have it set for uh, that direct monitoring is not turned on. So uh, direct monitoring will pass the input signal from the input directly to the output of the audio interface and not go through the inserts. So if you, you know, don't hear it while you're recording, but hear it at, on playback, make sure that you turn direct monitoring off your interface or uh, inside of Cubase. All right. All right, so we have a question from Braxel. Uh, Greg, how do I scrub audio in Cubase so I can hear the sound super slow and mark the spot exactly where sound starts? Okay, so let's come over here. So we have, when you get to the play tool, you'll have a different mode called scrub. Uh, so now if I wanted to just look at this, I can and we want to make sure I will switch this uh, so we can hear. So go to, and you want to make sure that you have the control room set up. Uh, so this will be routed through the listen bus. And I have this set to go through my phone, my phone's channel. So I'll deactivate that. So you want to make sure that when you go to your studio to audio connections, that you have the control room activated. So now when I, just come over here let's see if my computers and I go to my scrub tool and select it uh, and as we kind of zoom in here I'll just turn my control room up so you can hear a little so if it's not in scrub mode it would be kind of like a play tool so that you could do that, but if you just click and switch it to the scrub. So you could find the spot for an edit. So give that a try. All right, so we have Flavio checking in from Italy. Thanks for joining us. All right, Kusku says, thank you for your help. You're welcome. All right. Uh, Quellen asks, uh, is there a way to put uh, every track in a folder the same name at the beginning? Example, uh, kick and snare in a folder and I want to write only one time, disabled, and as a result, disabled. Um, okay, so let's say if we wanted to take a number of tracks, let me just switch to and kind of change the name uh, within a folder. So it's, we'll show you how you could do that. 
All right, so let's say if we if I wanted to take a uh, number of tracks. Okay, so I want to, let's say if I want to take all of these tracks and add the word disabled to the start. So if we wanted to go to the uh, project menu to the project logical editor. Um, we can say I want to take um, we'll say our container type is track. Uh, I want it to be the property is set to they are currently selected and we go to name and then we want to say prepend uh, disabled space okay so and we want this to be set to transform so now everything that is selected there I could just add the word disabled in front of all the tracks um, now let's see if we could do it by selecting the folder so we'll say um, media let's say our container type is folder track and let's get a property and property is set to parent object is selected let's see if this will do it um, so may not carry over but if you have the track selected again just and it's just two mouse clicks um, so we say So again, um, then we could just put that particular term. So you could prepend the naming conditions and you could save that as a preset as well. So let me know if that's helpful and what you want to accomplish. All right, um, so we see from Anto, that's, that's great. Thanks, Greg. Um, so we see Spike Williams. Glad that you can make it from uh, Rondo Wales. Says he's so out of sync. So we're glad you can make it today. All right, so we have a question uh, from Glenn Young. Uh, hi, Greg. Uh, I'm utilizing the control room feature to have separate outputs for monitors and headphones. When I use control room, I'm unable to preview loops and one shots from the library. Um, so I could preview. So let's say if I come and let's say if I have my control room set up currently and I wanted to audition different loops. Um, So that would go out of my control room output. Now, if I wanted it to go out of my headphone output, what I could do, uh, and if you wanted to change the destination to headphones, um, if you go to preferences to control room, you can see use phones channel as the preview channel. Uh, and then if we have the phones that are connected to like alternate outputs at this point, uh, when we go to our control room that you could right click and you'll see kind of the phones channel here. So now all of the previews are going to the phones channel and not the control room, which is what we're listening to on the live stream. So as soon as I go to preferences again and deactivate use phones channel that we could just do all the preview. So let me know if that's helpful for you but you could send it to uh, either either source or destination, so. All right, so Filter Freak saying, yay, it's Friday evening and it's Cracker Jack time. All right, so Richard Carpenter says educational.
All right, so we see uh, Couscous asks, um, I have another question. When I'm working with a very busy project, the track selected matters a lot. If I select one, the ASIO guard drops to 70%. If I select another, it rises to 100%. All right, so what, you know, when we see the meters, so let me just come over here to uh, my studio menu, and we'll just say, let's go to our audio performance meters. All right, so depending, you know, and we see the ASIO guard track. So, you know, and what this is going to indicate is, and we see, you know, the real-time performance and kind of the ASIO performance. So let's say on this particular track, if I had a number of insert plugins that were kind of heavy. So let's say um, I wanted to run something that with, uh, let's say, uh, multi-tap delay I wanted to run um, let's say a couple of multi-band compressors more just to drive the point home all right so i have a number of different plugins on this one particular track so what the asio guard is kind of if you have asio guard enabled um as soon as i select you know one track over like this track um and we see that it's you know, not showing a huge difference, but you know, what ASIO Guard is showing is kind of the CPU that's going on needed for real time uh, recording or playback. So if you had a number of different tracks that were playing back, let's see if we. So if I select a different track, this track is not in record. that it's really just gonna show you kind of the meters, you know, that it needs to kind of almost, because what this does is, you know, when you're running in ASIO Guard, these particular tracks are, um, you know, basically running at lower latencies than the rest of the track. So once ASIO Guard is activated, and depending how plugins on that particular track deal with um, you know, running at lower latencies, you may see the ASIO guard, um, you know, increase depending on what you, what track is selected. So the ASIO guard is reflecting this, you know, the audio performance based on the track selection when ASIO guard is enabled. So what ASIO guard, if you're not familiar with it is, is basically it runs kind of a, a hybrid uh, buffering structure so that only the tracks that are record enabled will show, um, you know, the tracks that are record enabled will be the ones that are showing uh, in the ASIO guard. So the, the tracks that are enabled to record are running at lower latencies and the other tracks are running at higher latencies. So, you know, if, I wouldn't worry about it so much, you know, just be, you know, worry that, you know, you know, if your project can play back and you realize that if you come here and you just, take it out of record, you know, or take it out of monitoring at that point that that could affect the ASIO guard metering. So, so, and if you didn't want to see, you know, the, it, the project's probably going to play back the same. And if you didn't want to see that, you know, change, like once everything is recorded, just simply come over to editing and just remove, if you get a project to mix console, just remove, enable record on selected audio track or selected MIDI track. So it's really indicating what the uh, ASIO, kind of like a prefetch, what it has to do to run that track at a lower latency. So that's what it's kind of indicating.
right. All right, so we see Glenn Young. Um, says thanks for all the great Cubase content. So it's great. Wonderful to see Brian Sawyer. All right, so we have Val Yu just saying hey there to the Cubase family. So wonderful to see you from Vienna. We have Harry Olive on as well. We have Peter from Montreal. All right, so we see... Um, all right, so I just saw my chat field just jumped. Uh, so from Heartbreak Time Machine, uh, is time warp different than tempo processing? So generally, um, you know, t it could, you know, in essence, it could be doing, you could treat them the same way. So what time warp is going to allow you to do, so I'm going to come over here and just do uh, time warp function. So what time warp is going to say is, okay, let me just turn on my tempo track. All right, so what time warp is going to allow us to do is to say, okay, I want measure, you know, 62, um, and let me just switch the mode here real quick. I'll take this out of musical mode. So I want measures, you know, what time warp allows us to do is to say, this is where I want measure 64. And I can move the grid to the performance. And when we get into like more tempo processing, so once we're on our tempo track and we come over here and we open up the process. What this would allow us to do is to say, okay, between here and here, I need, you know, a number of bars to fit directly into this, and it will calculate the tempo changes. So in essence, this could do it over a range of time, whereas time warp would be maybe for just honing in the grid to the recording. But this could process, okay, I need to be start here and end here at a particular tempo and that's what the process tempo would allow you to do so they there is some overlap um but i would say time warp is for kind of moving individual grids um and when you need to process like in a cello rondo between two points that's when the open pro the process tempo works a little better all right, so we have Daniela Tokan on. Thanks for joining us. So we have Michael Marshall from Somerset, UK. All right, uh, so we have a question from Val Yu. Um, how to lock video track with its audio? So when I cut and edit the audio, uh, it edits the video also, Cubase 12. So let's do a new project. I think we could just link them together. So let me just uh, import a video track. All right, so now I have both of these. Uh, if I select them together, they'll move. But let's see if I just come and um, I'm just going to hit Control or Command G. And now they're going to be just locked together that way so you could group them and if you wanted to ungroup them control or command u or let me just try g again and just select one yeah and then if i hit control or command u then i can move them individually so again just select both events control or command g and that would link those two together just like that so let me know if that's helpful All right, so value is like number 42. If you've learned a new tip or trick, make sure you do hit the like button. All 
All right, so we see, um, hi, is there a way to ramp tempo using time warp? Um, so I guess you could, you know, gradually make it, you know, faster or slower, what I think is probably the best method if you wanted to ramp tempo. So let's say if we have a tempo track, So let's say we have this activated and I wanted to ramp tempo. So if you extend this over to the right, you can see that you have step and ramp. And sometimes by default, it's kind of covered over uh, a little bit. So let's say if I have this set to ramp, I could put in like two different values here. And now as I just, now it's going to just ramp the tempo. So you could manually move, you know, if you do, uh, time warping you could manually move you know values you know slightly closer to each other you know if needed um, but it's probably faster so if we put this on warp grid um, you know we could move each of these ever so slightly closer and that would create a tempo ramp so um so let's say if we're here, uh, you know, if I move each of these, uh, so let me just undo that ramp. So if we say, okay, I want this to, So, but if you move each of these closer together, it could create, in essence, a ramp tempo. But, you know, I think the fastest way to do it is just to kind of, you know, enter in a ramped tempo. All right, so wonderful to see Patrick Emanuel A from India on. All right, uh, so we see Patrick asks, um, uh, is there a way to ramp tempo when you, uh, or sorry, your question is, uh, I have some bunch of notes, how to invert them inside a key editor, uh, different kind of inversions. So let's take a look. Okay, so there is uh, some, in, let's go ahead and just make this full screen here. All right, so, you know, you could do some stuff. So let's say, you know, maybe I wanted to at around E3 to, uh, you know, so if I wanted to select, you know, my MIDI data here, we go to MIDI functions. And if we wanted, <clears throat> you know, to mirror, we could do that. You could also reverse. Um, but one of the ones that you could do also is just come over uh, using the logical editor. So let's come over here to the logical editor. And we can say we want to take notes <clears throat> and we want to take, uh, let's say value one, I want to say E3. Or maybe we'll add the E3 up here. So we'll say value one is equal to E3 and value one, we want to mirror. Um, oh, I think we could, let's remove this line. So we're gonna take notes and mirror around E3. So now as we do this, you could choose to, um, you know, just come over here and mirror, let's say E3, let me try that. So you could do kind of inversions that way as well. So let me know if that's kind of that type of inversion that you want to do. And it's great to see you on Patrick.
All right, so we see a uh, thanks uh, question from Ted Springman. Uh, thanks, Greg. Can spectral layers export individual harmonics overtones of a lead vocal track and import into Cubase for processing of separate overtones? So I think we could do that. Let's take a look. Let's come to like this vocal example. And I know you could do this. This is a feature in the Pro. So we could obviously kind of see the harmonic overtone series as, as we look at uh, the audio file. And one of the selection modes that you're going to have here uh, is harmonics selection. So this point, um, so if I want it to just take, like, let's say if I go out of harmonics, selection so we can go okay one good frequency selection that i could kind of just come over here uh, and then as we do that we could just you know create a new layer from that particular selection um, and then if we wanted to even just kind of drag that particular layer um, so our new layer which is let's say the first overtone you know, we could drag that into uh, our audio. Let me just add an audio track below here. So, but then you could do kind of further processing, but again, just kind of come over. Um, and if you wanted to just kind of select you know, one overtone series, you could do that. Or if you wanted to, you know, go to right click and you could do kind of the, you know, the, the entire overtone harmonics as well. So if you wanted to do that, you could get all of them <clears throat> at once or just do it individually. And then, <clears throat> and then you could do further processing on it. All right, so we see from a question from the Heartbreak Time Machine. Uh, is it possible to invert the mouse scroll input? Um, so to do that, uh, it has to be kind of done at the uh, at the input, uh, at the operating system level. Sorry, my chat field just jumped. So I think if you just go to your OS level, that Cubase will just follow. Um, you know, whatever mouse direction scroll. So if you wanted to change that, I know that this could be a, a bit of an annoyance having to do it at the OS level, but you could just uh, come directly into um, your mouse and change uh, the, sc the scroll detection settings there, so. All right, so I see from uh, Daniela just asking, I got the email from last Friday. So I did, uh, and I may have forgotten to respond. It was kind of a busy weekend with, uh, this Friday was my wife's birthday. So I kind of was doing birthday stuff and then uh, my mom's birthday uh, two days later. So, and then my computer was kind of locked out. So I didn't get a chance to respond, but, um, but I'll read through it again uh, after the live stream today. Sorry about that. All right, so I see from Robert Higgins, uh, did you see my previous questions? Uh, I don't remember seeing them, Robert. Um, I'll just kind of scroll back. So I don't see any previous questions from today, Robert. Um, 
But if you want to ask him again, maybe it was um, maybe it was uh, too long, too many characters, or if it was from a previous live stream, we may have gone through them on the previous one. All right, so uh, let me know if anyone else has seen Robert's questions. Um, all right, so it's wonderful to see Nick on. I'm glad you can make it today, Nick. Hope you're doing well. All right, so um, so I just see from uh, Aramis Samar says ran out of space. If anyone could answer for me, that'd be would really appreciate that. So, um, so maybe if you want to try typing, I don't think I saw it, or if someone else saw it, if you want to uh, copy it and paste it back. So I'm not sure why sometimes uh, YouTube doesn't allow the comments in. So. All right, uh, so Robert has a question on WaveLab. Uh, why is there no process function in Montage, uh, only in the Wave Editor? All right, so let's open up WaveLab and take a look. So if you wanted to do like, you know, sample editing, the, you know, that's the, kind of the intention of the Wave Editor. Um, but if you wanted to, um, you know, so a lot of times if we are, we are in a particular montage, um, so let's say if we're here in this montage, just, um, and we wanted to do, you know, so there is, you know, particular, so say I want to take this and let's go ahead and you know if i wanted to do some processing to it here but you know the intention is that once it's in the montage you know we can add you know different effects and stuff like that so if you wanted to do um you know more of your stuff here but the intention is that you know if you wanted to uh you know do particular editing that that's going to be done kind of at the um you know at the actual source file and then the montage would reference the source file so a lot of the processing would kind of you know for doing fade ins and fade outs uh and other processing so setting levels but you know we could do a lot of that inside of you know so you know it could be just a different approach you know so okay i wanted to do uh, a fade out here of this um You know, so instead of doing a process uh, of a fade out, I could just come over here and do stuff. But, you know, you could just simply come and say, okay, I just wanted to go to edit at the source tracks. And then if I have done a particular change here, that it would automatically reflect in the montage. So, you know, think of the, the wave editor is doing the source tracks and the montage is kind of more assembly for that. All right. Yeah, and as Nick says, anything that's done in a montage is non destructive. All right, so we have uh, Ed Visenor saying, thank you, just wanted to come in and express my gratitude for all the work you do, Greg, and the countless hours you put in for us to learn Cubase. So thank you very much for the kind words. 
it's always it's always appreciated on my end uh, I don't take it lightly so I appreciate it I'm just glad to be able to help people Okay, so we have a question from uh, the Heartbreak uh, Time Machine. Uh, how can I delete a section, a selection area affected? Uh, how can I define a selection area affected by time warp and other sections that aren't? Okay, so let's say um, I'll duplicate this particular track. Okay, um, and let's say on this file, I'm just going to uh, bounce selection. Okay, so let's say this event here is not in musical mode, but this one is. So, you know, now if I want it to, you know, so if the events are in musical mode, so let's say if I wanted to kind of come and let's just make sure I have tempo track turned on. So we'll say warp grid. So we can see how this one will be affected by tempo changes and this one not. So just make sure that the event, one event is in musical mode that will be changed and events that you don't want to be in musical mode, just simply uh, select for it not to be in musical mode. So let me know if that's helpful. All right, so we see Robert Higgins just says, uh, you know, after replying to Nick on his comment, it's non-destructive, so they got to change that montage. It's really a waste of time then. It only allows you to rearrange the audio file. So you could do a tremendous amount of things in the montage, uh, but, you know, some things happen at the source level, um, you know. So, but, you know, if you have a particular type of edit that you want to do within the montage that, you know, just let us know. Uh, there's just different approaches to things uh, whether you do, um, you know, whether you need to do it destructively or non-destructively. Okay, so you see Robert Higgins says, Nick, get rid of montage, have destructive editing, use save as, or have a backup of the file that you are you are editing. So you don't have to use the montage inside of WaveLab. So it allows you to kind of, you know, but if you're doing stuff like, you know, radio station spots and, you know, uh, podcast interviews, uh, that's where you'd want kind of non-destructive editing. Those types of workflows are very, very adept and it's very useful for that. All right, so Michael Pierce just uh, saying good evening to everyone. He's just dropping in and out, and he's very busy. So wonderful to see you, Michael. Hope you're doing well. And if you've learned a new tip or trick, make sure you do hit the like button and subscribe to the channel. All right, um, Sarah Go says, I have Cubase 12 Pro and I started many years ago when I bought Elements for $100. Uh, can I give it to my friend with the key? He is very interested to start discovering Cubase. Um, you know, it depends if you if you have a separate license, you, you know, it's your license and you could lend it to someone. Um, he may have to pay if he wanted to play around with it, then he might have to um you know if he wanted to purchase it from you you may have to pay there might be a, re a registration uh, like a, a transfer fee uh, but if you upgraded your cubase elements 12 to cubase pro you probably don't have a separate license of elements so but he could always you know play around with the trial version it's 60 days as well
Right, sorry, my chat field just jumped. Okay, so you see from a heartbreak time machine, just says thank you for answering all the questions today, Greg. And I see Chaz dude's to comment. Oh, Greg's going to laugh when he runs the Hangouts later and sees his comments to index it. So, All right, so we have Mark Winslow saying aloha. So thanks for joining us from Hawaii. Hope, and glad to see you're back on. Glad to be back on the live stream. So just seeing some speculation from Jazz Dude and Nick saying, I remember times when a talented, simple songwriter with a guitar could have lots of success and fans no DAW involved. Only a tape machine seems to disappear step by step. And next comment is... Uh, Dude, when you turn up at a studio and end up uh, in a recording before the day had ended, you can still do that in the DAW. You don't have to necessarily go down a rabbit hole of possibilities. You could just hit record and mix it and be done really quickly. It's a lot of people choose not to work that way. So. Gareth says Wave Lab is the bomb, as they say in the hood. All right, wonderful to see Michael Teams from Weatherford, Texas. Glad you can make it today. I was thinking of you earlier as it's starting to get warmer here in Washington, D.C. area. All right, so we see Robert Higgins says uh, he uses WaveLab elements, does not have process and elements. Process shows up in the pro version. Um, yeah, I don't think, let me see if I have elements installed on my machine. I may just have the pro. Yep. So let's say if I get a WaveLab elements 11 here. Okay, so I'll just All right, so let's just check it out. So we'll get open up quick file here. Okay, so let's say we have this going on. Okay. All right, so, and let's take it into uh, a montage. So let's say new. Um, let's do an audio montage. Create.
All right, so even if we're in our montage here, um, so I can see that in the elements that there isn't, um, but you know, one of the cool things is, you know, once you're here, you could just say edit source and then do your destructive edits here. And then when you go back to the montage, so let's say if I'm here and I reversed uh, this particular file, so we'll just, or let's do a fade in. Right, let's just reverse that. So now when we just come directly to, you know, the montage, you know, we could see that, you know, that's going to be updated. So, but yeah, I mean, it's just two different editing workflows between those two different, and it's very common in, in audio editors. Okay, um, you see Gareth is very happy that Michael Teams is on. All right, uh, Mike, uh, so we see Braxel ask, uh, Greg, how do you normalize tracks correctly? So one of the things that you could do is, you know, just select a number of the tracks. And if you go to processes to normalize, so a lot of people, if you had files that maybe weren't at the normal or, or optimum gain, uh, you could set, it used to be like, okay, you know, people would take their final master and normalize it to minus one dB to get the volume louder. Um, but we could also do it based on loudness normalizing. Uh, so based on like loudness units or LUFs, which is loudness unit full scale. So if you wanted to have files that were set up for streaming services, like Spotify would be minus 14 LUFs is kind of what they look for you could just do it directly there. So just select it and you go to audio to processes to normalize. Um, and then you could be all set with that. So let me just go delete and we'll be right back to where we were. see Michael Teams and Gareth had a had a great face to face chat, so that's great. Let's see, was Greg in Texas too? So I was in Texas on a I was in Dallas on a layover. Uh yeah, for a layover when I was going on vacation for a couple hours. So my son got addicted to big waffles in Texas. Okay, um, all right. All right, so you see Braxel is going to just commenting to Michael Teams. He's going to see Andy Timmons at Guitar Sanctuary tonight, McKinney, and asking Michael Teams if he's going. If he goes, please say hi to my friend uh, Brian Meter, who works there. He used to work at Washington Music for a number of years. Super smart, sharp guy. So look for him. Tell him I said hello. All right, so we see Michael Teens has granted my family and myself one gallon of Hawaiian coconut ice cream. Well, that's very apropos. So, All right, so we see Greg Roulette says, hello, I'm thinking about getting Cubase. So I think it's going to be a wonderful solution for you. And you could always come here and get all of your questions answered twice a week on Tuesdays and Fridays starting at, at 1 p.m. U.S. Eastern Time. All right, uh, so we have Couscous is asks, uh, one more question. Is it possible to save audio sample files used in Groove Agent SE uh, in the Cubase project folder? Okay, so let me just... Uh, I'll add a new, I'll just, um, 
I'll just create some new audio files here. Just on all right, so say I just have a number of samples. I'm going to drag these into Groove Agent. All right, so now what you can do is when you go to export kit with samples, um, all you have to do is choose your project folder here. So, um, so at this point you can say, okay, I want to go to projects and I want it to be stored in, um, say my jump off. And then you could give it a name. And then you could export. So just right click, export kit with samples. And then you could just export it directly inside of whatever folder you choose right there. So give that a shot. All right, uh, Daniela Tokan asks, uh, Greg, can you give a nice example how to use FX modulator for boom sound with sidechain uh, without sidechain automation? Okay, so let me just... Okay, I think I have a project that may be set up for this. Let me just see. All right, so let me just see if I could get a um, just a quick loop on this. All right, just reread it, make sure I'm answering it correctly. Okay, so let's say I want the bass. All right, so let's come over here. Let's go to our inserts. Get to our FX modulator. Okay, so let's say our effect that we want to do is let's say compress. Um, all right, so let's make this just like a super fast. So I'm just going to choose um, maybe something like this. <laughs> Let me 
see if there's we, we start with This one here, so let's say. All right, so we'll come over to let's say our FX modulator here. So. Uh, like in this case, uh, if we just wanted to, like, let's do just like a quick volume change. So it's like. So, but if you wanted to do even, um, let's see if I have a good example for. You know, so let's say if we wanted to do this, let me just take the volume off. We'll add, or let's say we want, to, you know, just come over and let's say, so if you want to create like kind of boom type of effects. So you could definitely do, you know, stuff like that and, you know, being able to kind of, you know, when you get into the compressor uh, to adjust the amount of milliseconds that's also kind of going on. So let's say we mute this. This rate, you could just say, okay, I want to uh, adjust, but you could do the attack down to, you know, 0.1 milliseconds for that. So you could just kind of set your threshold. So if you want to do different effects like that, and I'm sorry, I don't have a, probably like a perfectly dialed in example, but I think that will give you the idea, Daniela. Okay, just reading through comments. Okay, so we see uh, from Charles uh, asking, hi, how can I see the audio files option in the upper side of editor? Uh, it's not in view at my place. Um, so I'm not sure if it's dealing with, let me just open up a project with some more audio files in it. Okay, so I'm not sure if it's the overview um, that you're talking about here. So where you could I just come over here and be able to uh, see if that's the upper area where you see kind of the project window overview. So if you want to see that amount and be able to kind of navigate, um, but let me know if I'm if I'm missing it, if I'm misunderstanding.
Okay, so we see John Koskin saying a uh, prompt that says uh, Cubase closed unexpectedly with usual choices of no third-party plugins. And would I send an automatic report to Steinberg? There's no plugins on startup. Um, so it's usually, you know, John Koskin, when you get kind of a message where you get the message afterwards, like when you're starting it, is it's the result of the last time that Cubase was closing that a plugin probably crashed it. So it's not on startup. It's reflecting what happened the last time Cubase exited. So you could definitely send the report to Steinberg. They might be able to isolate it to a particular plugin for you. All right, wonderful to see Robbie Bowling from Dallas, Texas, who just just rolled in. So glad you can make it today. I see Braxel knows Brian Brian Meter. So if you see him, please tell him hello for me. I saw him at Nam last uh, last month. All right, so we see, um, is it possible to record a vocal on a lane that has a vocal recorded on it already? Meaning if I recorded a verse vocal, can I record a chorus vocal on the same lane later on in a track or every take creates a new lane even if there's no information at that particular moment? Um, so as you're recording, you know, you know um, so let me know if you actually need to have them, you know, on, you know, so we can think of each recording is going to be going on to a new lane, um, you know, and generally, you know, like people would be worried about you know, like how many tracks you go, like when you're dealing with like a four track or eight track, 16 track, you know, kind of minimizing the track counts. But, you know, generally in a computer, it's not necessarily an issue because we have, you know, a lot of tracks that are available to us. There's no kind of fixed limit. So, but every time you record a new thing, it's going to go onto its own separate lane. But you could always just create a new track and record the chorus vocal on that. All right. Uh, so we have a question also. Um, is it possible to select a specific track? to send the render in place to, or does it need to make a new track every time? So it'll make a new track every time, uh, but you can, so let's say if I'm here on this particular project, um, if you have the track selected, so let's say like I had uh, MIDI selected here, but it doesn't, it's not necessarily limited to MIDI. If you have the track selected as opposed to events, um, I could come over to my render in place and we get to the render settings. And when the track is selected as opposed to the event, we could also choose to just remove the source tracks. So if I wanted to come and just say, okay, let's remove the source tracks, I say render. And what it's going to do is it's now remove the MIDI track and just, and just create it an audio track uh, in its place. So if we undo that, we'll go back straight to our MIDI data. So you could do it like that. If you wanted to go to a specific track, maybe take the output of that track, route it to uh, a group channel. So say, okay, I want this going to a stereo group. And now at this point on whatever audio track, I want that group as the input. So you could then do kind of a real time pass and record it to a specific track, but generally render place will create a new track. All right, we see for Gareth, it's feeding time at the zoo. So thanks, we'll hopefully see you back soon. Yeah, and I just see Michael Team's comment. Uh, also, says his suggestion is to make more tracks so you can EQ fix anything without messing up your track. Track amounts aren't a limitation if you're on Pro. 
All right. All right, so we see Michael Pierce has to dash. Hopefully he'll be back in about an hour or so. All right, so we see uh, Greg Willett asked, uh, does the full version of Pro ever go on sale? So it was just on sale last month uh, or in March. There was a big sale, so I wouldn't anticipate one for a while. It's um, not usually something that's on sale, but you know, depending on your dealer, you may be able to get a, a discounted price from a dealer. All right, uh, so we see from Peter, uh, what are the advantages of having the stereo out channel visible in both the arranger and mix console if I use the control room, especially if I place the desired inserts in the control room? Uh, example, limiter and supervision. So a lot of times people will use, you know, the, they'll want to, if you want the effects to be included in the actual file, like when you go to export it, that's when you'd want to use the stereo out as opposed to using the control room. So let me just, I'll just uh, revert this file here quickly. Okay, so it, as we're doing this, if we're playing. All right, so now effects that are on the master bus. So if you're putting a limiter here, so let's say as we're doing this, you say, okay, I want a maximizer. So this is going to be included in the exported audio file. So, uh, and then plugins that are here, let's say, okay, my supervision plugin. And maybe if I was doing like a room correction plugin, you know, where we don't, you know, so sometimes if you have sonar works, for instance, and it's doing a drastic EQ to correct the anomalies in the you know, acoustic, uh, you know, acoustic issues in your particular facility, you know, you'd want that on the monitoring path, but you don't necessarily want your room correction EQ to be applied when you export the audio mix down. So think of plugins that you use in the control room as being relegated for, you know, the intention is that it's the monitoring path. So it's great for metering, room correction type of plugins. And if you, you know, you could run it through the limiter in the control room, but when you go to export it, these plugins in the control room aren't going to be a part of the exported file. So a lot of times when people are running it through a limiter or like a, you know, a master bus compressor, they would put that on the master stereo output because when they go to do the export audio mix down, that that sound is automatically included in the file and not is not just playing it on the way back in the monitoring path. So you think about this as being in the file path and this just in the audio monitoring path is your control room. Okay, so we see um, just a question. Uh, in Very Audio, how can you enable preview sounds from each note? All right, so let's say we're in Very Audio. So one thing you want to do is first is to make sure that when you get your audio connections that you have the control room active and on your main outputs, 
that you could have your outputs here set like a stereo out set to not connected and we want the path so say these are going to my yamaha hs7s these are going to my uh mix left and right output so that's where my monitoring path is going so now when i go to double click and we go to very audio we'll have it do its analysis and you want to make sure that you have this uh this little speaker icon turned on so now if i come here and move the notes uh, without that turned on, the acoustic feedback, you don't hear changes once this is turned on. So it has to be routed through the control room is ideal. And then make sure that you have the acoustic feedback on. And then you could adjust accordingly. Then you could hear the changes as you select the note segments. All right, so we see it's 21 degrees Celsius in Finland from Uno Memento. So I think it's about what it was here this morning. So glad you're having better weather. All right. Okay, so we see uh, from Charles Davis, uh, is it possible to open a channel insert from the mixer window without having to click on it? Um, so we could do it in the, uh, you know, so let's say if we're in the mixer, so you could set up a uh, remote control. So let's say if we have uh, an insert, Let's say we go to distortion. We could say, okay, I want the VST bass amp here on the bass. Um, so often it's, you know, pretty quick to do that. But if you want to open up, uh, let's say insert slot one, let's say from a MIDI remote command. Um, I think if you come over, so let's say, okay, we go to my MIDI remote here that we could set up a MIDI remote to do it. So I'll just put this in my untitled page. Let's say I want to take this function and let's go to selected track, uh, insert. Um, and let's go to, I think if we go to, uh, you could set next in previous insert effect. So I'm going to say next from this button uh do this button previous and then let's um then you'll see edit plugin so i'm going to put this in the bottom so this will be next plugin previous plugin and then edit plugin so let's say on that particular track if i did everything correctly let's jump back to my mix console and i'll add another insert Okay, so now I could open the plugin. So let's say I go to previous plugin and I could open up the bass amp without having to, to be on that particular track. So we say next plugin. So you could do it through like MIDI remote if you want it to. So, and again, just go to uh, the MIDI remote and this is assuming you just have some type of MIDI remote surface that's been defined come over to selected channel to inserts and strip effects insert viewer um, and then you could just say okay you, know, you want to do next insert slot previous insert uh, and then you could choose um, 
under actions just to uh, edit plugin. So that's how you could do it without using the mouse if you wanted to. Okay. Um, okay, so Greg Goulette, who's looking to get Cubase, says his computer was built last year for gaming. So, all right, we have Gerald Ely checking in from Martinez, California. He's in the midst of setting up Cubase on a new computer. I chose to reinstall all my stuff. Uh, hey, Greg, any tips? Um, you know, sometimes, you know, reinstalling everything from scratch can solve a lot of issues. Uh, I guess my tip would be be patient. Um, it may take a little while, but, you know, it's and sometimes when you're going a new system, you're like, oh, I don't need this plug in. It's a little dodgy. I don't need this or OK, I'll configure this. It's a great time to kind of reevaluate. You know, it's like getting a new dresser. It's like I don't need those socks anymore. You know, there is a hole in them, and, you know. Um, so just be patient and, you know, you're probably going to be better off in the long run. So, and congratulations on getting new computer. All right. So we see from Peter, he asked, uh, thank you, Greg. So inserts placed in the control room do not get printed. That is correct. So it's only going to be on the monitoring path and it's not going to be, uh, printed into the X. It's not going to be embedded into the exported audio file. All right, uh, so we see from Braxel just asks, um, so he just says, uh, Greg, can you change the order of the bus faders in the mix console? I can move them to the far right, but I want the stereo bus on the far left of the far right hand area. So, um, all right, so let's say we have a number of buses. So we'll come here and I'll just add some more groups here. Okay, so I have group one, group two, group three, and my stereo out, we see this reflected on my mix console. Um, all right, so let's say if I So if you want to see it in the mix console, um, so I can move them to far right, but I want the stereo bus in the far left of the far. So what you can do is let's say I take my stereo out. Let's go to your visibility and go to zones. So let's take my stereo out. And now my stereo out is going to be kind of anchored to the left. So let me know if that's what you want to do. So it, instead of kind of being anchored to the right or kind of the last channel in the center zone, we could think of this as like um, like a three zone console. So I could make it all the way over to the left and just have my master fader there. So let me know if that's what you want to do, Braxel. Michael Teams wants everyone to whack the like button. Okay, so we see that Gerald Ely used to uh, inhale Neapolitan ice cream sandwiches when he was a kid. So that's good to know. Mm -hmm. All right, so we have Tiago checking in from Brazil. Uh, thanks for joining us this afternoon, today. All right. Um, okay, so Peter just says that he joined a broadcast a little late today. To him and his wife were on a grocery run, so that's understandable. Having food at home is good. All right. So Gareth wants everyone to whack a like now. So. 
All right, so we see a uh, question. Uh, is there a deadline to send our videos about Cubase live stream? So if it's like with questions, you know, sometimes I get questions like a minute before the live stream starts. Um, so, uh, and I'm, you know, like maybe like the last half hour, I may not look for emailed questions that come in, uh, but there really is no deadline if I don't get to it, um, you know, in this live stream. If you send a video, I'll, you know, work hard to get it into the, the next available live stream. So there's no hard fat, you know, if it's something that's really simple, I may be able to address it. Sometimes, you know, people may send me a quick clarification or a screenshot during the live stream as I'm going through their question. Uh, but th there's no strict deadline. We'll try to, we'll try to answer it as quickly as we can. So. All right. Um, all right. So we see Peter just saying he's trying to replicate something. He saw a guy Mitchell Moore do opens the key editor, plays the instrument and played notes appeared without actually hitting the record button in the transport. All right. So let's say, um, I'll just, Okay, so let me just come over and see if we could replicate that. I think I may know what he's doing. Okay, so, all right, so let's say we're in the key editor. All right, let's say we're full screen. So it could be that, you know, while he's playing, um, so let's say I'll just solo this track. Yeah, let me just start it here. All right, so let's say I'm not in record, but if I come over here to the key editor, it could be that he has maybe uh, recording in editor opened. So check to see if, um, and it could be also, so let's just make sure. So, um, but yeah, it could be just the record in editor is turned on and maybe you don't see kind of like, So maybe he's just hitting a button to like the record button and he has record in editor. So now if I hit record and I don't see anything, but if I have record in editor and hit record. So it could be that just while he's in the key editor that he has this record in editor button enabled and he's maybe hitting a keyboard shortcut. So let me know if that looks kind of what he's doing. Let's see, Gerald E. Lee just says, thanks, Greg. And yes, there are some plugins I'm not installing on the new computer. So yeah, it, it happens. So it's like every time you move to a new house, there's stuff that, you know, that just doesn't make it, doesn't make the cut. Okay, um, so we see, uh, hi Greg from France. Question is, how to easily change Groove Agent SE tracks to audio tracks when it's already recorded in MIDI? Render in place doesn't work for me in Cubase Pro 12. Um, all right, so let's go ahead and let me switch projects here.
All right, so the render in place will definitely work. So, but let's come over here. All right, so let's say we have um, like. All right, and just make sure it's the only. Okay, so let's say, um, I'll just open this up. All right, so let's say we have um, our pattern here and I'm just gonna drag the pattern over. All right, so one thing is if render in place isn't working, make sure that like you don't have the actual track selected here. So now I'm going to select uh, the track. And if I wanted to render this in place as stereo, we would go to edit. And again, you know, if it's record enabled, it could be excluded from the render in place. So let's go to our render settings and I'll say, okay, let's render. Okay, so now we can see that this is rendered in place and we go to li listen to the file. We can just switch my playback to my play tool. Now, if you wanted to even do separate outputs, so let's say my kick is going out of kit mix, my snare is going out of output two, output three is my hi-hat, let's say overheads are going to output five, output six, and let's say toms is going out of output four, you know, so we could, break this out so now that these are being routed to individual outputs and we can see these individual outputs here um, I could just I could select the track or the event again and we'll say render in place and we'll say okay let's do channel settings um, we'll mute the source events and now I'll render and now since each of the tracks are going to separate outputs um, we could have you know the kick and all of the different tracks spread out into different tracks so render in place should definitely work when it may not work is if you actually come over and maybe if you have the track record enabled so check that All right, so we see Michael Team says 97 likes. Uh, that's great. All right, so we see Rakesh uh, Sharma just says so sweet. Thanks for being on. Okay, so we see uh, Tiago says, uh, no, Greg, I mean, some months ago, you and Steinberg was asking for some uh, words about all you've learned from the live streams. Uh, they are great. I wish to contribute. Yeah, so you could definitely, uh, yeah, so those videos, um, we're definitely still accepting those. So we might just have those continually evolve. Uh, so if you do want to just kind of submit something of how the live streams have helped you, you could do like a cell phone video or something from a webcam and just kind of share your thoughts on how the live streams have been helpful for you. That, that would be great. So you can still send those videos in and you could share them with me like via WeTransfer or Google Drive, something of that nature. Uh, and you could send the link to Club Cubase at Steinberg.de. So once again, Club Cubase at Steinberg.de. So we got some great videos from people and if other people want to do it, that would be just wonderful to be able to utilize. All right. All right, so Peter, we see uh, about the retrospective record, uh, the record without, um, so probably what he's doing, and if we wanted to do a retrospective record uh, in an editor, you know, you could just, and I think you could just do it from a particular keyboard shortcut as well. So, but let's say I was here and um, 
so like we have nothing in our editor i'll just hide my controller window here okay so now and at this point you could just say okay when i go to the track um, you'll see retrospective recording and then you could just say uh, insert as linear recording and then that would just automatically go in so if my song position you know let's say I'm here and I'm just like I could just say oh you know just hit the retrospective recording and insert as linear and then that could automatically show up without hitting record. So Cubase will always be capturing uh, the MIDI data and, and capturing a buffer. And I think you have 10,000 events stored per track if you're so inclined. All right, so we see um, Michael Teams just says, uh, Howdy, Greg, uh, tried to render in place a MIDI track, but it would not. Uh, this was in Cubase 6.5, so not sure what happened. So, you know, if it's a MIDI track that's going to like a hardware piece, you know, it would, you know, need to be con configured as an external instrument if it's, uh, you know, going to a particular, you know, sometimes MIDI tracks going into an instrument going to a virtual instrument may render like you know all may render audio files for all the outputs because the MIDI it the MIDI track itself doesn't necessarily know what's going to generate the sound so Cubase may generate all the sounds for all the outputs so that if different notes were being sent to different outputs it's automatically captured uh, but you know render in place definitely works so and from when it was introduced. All right, so we see uh, Sarah Ghost just says, one of my dreams is having Dorico inside the Cubase and not a separate app or maybe something like Melodyne that could be opened inside the project in Cubase. So I'm sure that, you know, both development teams, you know, I think have something similar in mind so but it's obviously we wanted to make sure everything with dorco was you know super up to speed as they're building a whole new program from scratch and those guys have done an amazing job so kudos to them Uh, so we see Peter uh, about the recording, uh, just saying, no, Greg, I get the insert part. Uh, in his case, the notes are actually appearing as he plays them. Um, so, yeah, if you want to share a link to the video, I'd be happy to kind of, yeah, I'm sure I could figure out what he's doing with it. And you see Peter just says, uh, you don't have to lose any, any more time with my question. Perhaps I could send something off to you via email if you don't mind. So, yeah, please do. Um, be happy to take a look at it. So, All right, so you see um, just a question. Uh, hello, Greg. My CC121 stopped working. Uh, any recommendations for other options for Cubase 12. I think with the MIDI remote um, that you could take any controller and really kind of customize it. So like I, you know, you've probably seen, you know, I, I, like a Korg Nano control. I think it's $79 in the U.S. Um, that I just kind of bought on a, on a whim. And, you know, this is kind of eight faders. It has a number of buttons and knobs and transport and it's very small um and it's kind of plug and play with cubase with new midi remote in version 12 you know check to make sure you like your cc 121 generally those things are built like tanks um you know see if it's not powering on if maybe it's a power supply if you have a yamaha repair shop 
Um, you know, I've had my CC 121 since 2008, so it's 15 years, um, and it's still uh, going strong. Um, you know, I've had the same CC 121 on my desk to my left. Um, so a lot of Yamaha stuff could be pretty over-engineered. It could also, if like the fader is not moving, you know, maybe recalibrating the fader. And if you look in the documentation, you could see uh, the process for doing recalibration. So, all right. So, all right. So we see Peter just can't trying to figure out the uh, record without play so all right so gareth is just indicating that he naturally is naturally very audios so that's a good thing to admit to so all right so wonderful to see sable winters on the live stream okay and gareth says the sable winters is able to stratos stratospherize the likes so that's always good all right, uh, Travel Launch asks, uh, where can I get a CC-121? So the CC-121 has been discontinued uh, probably about a year into COVID. So maybe about two years ago. There's still some floating around. Uh, you can see them on a used market. Um, you know, they, they do hold their value. Uh, some dealers may have some still kind of lurking in basements. Um but you could check, you know, check the used market. Like in the U.S., there's, you know, Reverb.com, where you can find used gear. And obviously, you know, eBay, I'm sure you could find something like that. But it's a really wonderful controller with great integration. All right, uh, so we have Anthony, Jose, uh, and Madi. Uh, can I use Cubase to automatically change the patch on my keyboard on a live show? I have a CK61. Um, so if you have tracks that are playing in, like, you know, that backing tracks that are playing in your live show and you wanted to automate um, switching sounds, uh, at that point, what you could do is. You know, as we come over here, you could just say, okay, I wanted to draw in uh, program changes. So, you know, you could say, okay, I just want to come here and, you know, in that bank. And then at this point, you know, at this point in the song, go to a different sound, go to a different sound. So you could just simply draw in program changes. So if it's going on in the linear manner you could do that i know a lot of people that play live and they'll just have this set up for their roads patch and they have another patch here and let's say you know they'll duplicate the track um and then they have this on midi channel one as a roads they hit the arrow down key. This is playing a piano. They hit arrow down. That's playing organ. And they could just kind of navigate up and down to change their different sounds on different tracks. Um, this is also a great use of VST Live, which is kind of a performance tool. So if you're doing like full concert production, uh, you could do that in VST Live where you could set up, you know, to automatically, you know, go you know hit a button and it, all of your keyboard sounds will change it could also you know shoot the lyrics out to ipads it could send the chord changes to musicians it could control the light show uh it could play back backing tracks and record the concert all at once so if you're doing a lot of live work you know check out vst live is really kind of purpose built for that particular scenario but you could have program changes uh in the middle uh, of tracks so just come here and you want to say okay i want to show hide the controller lanes and i want to you know just have my program changes so as we're playing it will automatically change the sound for you and you can put in bank and program change messages if you need to Okay, you see, say Michael Teams is granted Sable Winters one gallon of cookies and cream ice cream. So, sounds very generous. Thank you, Michael. All right.
great. All right, so I think I'm at the end of uh, questions that were asked so far, but let me go ahead and check out. Uh, I know we had questions that were sent in advance, so let's go look at those. Bear with me just for a moment. I open up document. All right, and this was kind of sent in by Soren, I think, um, by email. Uh, it was basically how to edit samples independently on the same drum pad in Groove Agent. Okay, so let's go ahead and uh, take, I'll just do a new project here. And there's an error message that uh, Soren had noticed. So I'm going to add an instrument track. Let's add a Groove Agent SE. I think you aren't running full Groove Agent, but it'll be the same. So let's come over here to loops and samples. And all right, so let's say we're going to find kicks. All right, so let's say we have that as a kick. All right, let's find something. All right, so let's find this, which has an attack, and we'll set these. And let me just. Okay, so now we have two different kicks. All right, and we want to layer these together. So instead of switching by velocity, that we want these two sounds to be layered. So I'm gonna go to um, my main, and then we'll choose to layer these two sounds. All right, now what Soren had wanted to do, since we have two samples, is to, as we adjust, let's say the, um, the panning, so let's say only to the right or to the left, or let's adjust our tuning, that both samples will do, will um, respond to these changes. But if I want it to only have one sample respond, um, so if we come over here and we activate, let's say, uh, edit selected samples on pads. So now when I do this, we get this message at the bottom. So what I want to do is to right click uh, and then on the parameter. So let's say I want to adjust my volume, but for only one layer. So I'm going to right click and choose forget automation. So now this layer, we can just, uh, so once we do that, we can adjust and treat these independently. So just click on uh, forget automation for the particular parameter. So again, if I say, Now we can say, so now when you turn this on, you can, so try just right clicking, then you could edit the different uh, parameters differently. Okay, uh, I think this was sent in from Jan. Um, so let me just open up the project just to show it. Uh, it says, is there a way in spectral layers, um, Pro9, to keep my display set up, see attached uh, image? I want to keep the spectral layers showing both wave and my choice of colors palette in the editor window. The problem is every time I start spectral layers, my uh, settings disappear, even though I save the Cubase project. Um, so I, I ran into the same thing. I think what Jan is trying to do is to, as we drag this down, where you can see a bit of the waveform, 
with um, you know with the control here so and then if we saved this project um, and let's revert so let's say I move this and let's revert the project that this adjustment where we see the waveform and the spectrum view won't be won't be uh, retained so we still have to kind of set that I will mention that to the team but it I'm not sure if it's a uh, you know, it could be a, a, a limitation of ARA. Uh, I'm not sure, but I'll make sure to pass that along so that that can be retained, uh, those settings. Um, so sorry about that. All right, and another spectral layers question. Um, says, hi, Greg, uh, best way to delete slash clean up spectral layers files that are not used from the layers list. Uh, my attempt says you can't delete an external layer. Um, so when we, let's say I have two layers here. So I have one that's gonna be, um, let's say the vocals. So I have like the backing tracks here in yellow. And let's say the vocals. Maybe I'd say things a different way. There's a All right, so All right, so I, I think what Jan's message was when you have this selected and go to layers and Let's say if we wanted to delete a layer um, that we may get this message, you can't delete an external layer. So try uh, to select, make sure that the layer is selected here. And let's see if we get the same message. Uh, and then you could just delete that layer. So try just to make sure that when you are doing it, um, that you have the layer selected and not kind of the uh, actual audio file directly here. So again, I'll just revert this quickly. So we can see our two layers. So while, you know, so it depends on what you have selected. So if you want to just delete um, like the backing track, you know, with this, with the file selected at this hierarchy, um, we will get kind of that message. But if I select the actual layer here and then delete that you won't get that layer or you could also just select it here and right click and delete the layer as well. All right, so we had another question. Um, hello, Greg, can you review how to do cycle markers using the range tool? For some reason, it's not working for me. Um, so, and this is really kind of tied into a preference where if I have the range selection that we could have the left and right locators kind of automatically follow that. Uh, so let's go to our Cubase preferences. And I think it's under editing and maybe like cycle follows range selection. So I'm going to enable cycle follows range selection, hit apply. And now you can see that the left and right locators are automatically um, following my range selection right there. So. So once again, I go to preferences and then we want to um, cycle follows range selection. Once that is turned off, then it's going to function independently with that enabled. It will just now automatically just follow like so. All right, so a question from Matthias. Um, 
Hi, I was wondering if it's possible to try drum expansions before buying them. I'm interested in getting the Metro Heights pack for Groove Agent, but I want to test it if it is possible. Uh, thank you so much in advance. So I looked through today and I didn't see any trial versions for the drum expansions. Um, you know, and a lot of the drum expansions are done by third party companies and we sell them on our, you know, on our website for, you know, Groove Agent customers. Um, but I, I don't see any that are currently work that are currently offering trial versions and that you know oftentimes i'm not sure if this is the case but oftentimes the companies that make it will choose not to have a trial version um so that happens too but i don't know of any way to do that all right um so we see just question um Hi, hopefully this question can make it into the next club Cubase. Uh, using Cubase 12 Pro with the UA Apollo interface, the Apollo doesn't delay compensate uh, for aux channels. So when trying to record aux channels, there's a delay. Uh, I've tried the range tool to set the, to get the range selection to, to determine the delay, but what is the best way to move an audio event so visually everything lines up? Uh, the track delay in the inspector appears to be milliseconds only and won't move the waveform visually uh, what is the best way to move the waveform by an amount of samples forward or backward uh, and all right so let's go ahead and take a quick look um, so let's say we have i duplicated this track and let's say they're going to be ever so slightly off from each other so i'm going to come um, and let me just create the problem here all right all right so let's say when you zoom in on a waveform you can say okay this one um let's say we want this peak so we want to determine the timing difference between these two files and be able to shift uh the particular file to match Okay, so what we could do is I'm going to grab my range selection tool and we're going to make sure that snap is turned off. And I'm going to just start the range. Let's say I want it to be at the peak of this waveform here. Okay, so I'm just going to come and say, okay, from the peak of this waveform to the peak of that waveform. And now we can see that this is 46 samples. So what we want to do is to move this over 46 samples to the left or earlier. So we could do this in the project logical editor. So let's come set it up. So we'll go to our project logical editor and let me just um, remove. All right. So we say we want to take and let's say um and we want to maybe have the event that is selected so we want to say audio and we want to say the property is the event is uh selected okay so we want to take our selected events and then we want to move it 40 was it 46 samples uh 48 samples over to the left okay or earlier in time so at this point we want to say make sure that we have transform let's go to insert and we'll say position and we want to subtract and let's say we want to set our time frame to samples and let's say 48 samples okay so now this is going to take our selected event here this black one and we hit apply it's going to move it 48 samples over to the left so you could just do it like that and after a while you may notice that certain paths you know you know may be off depending on hardware and dsp processing time so you could have these saved as presets so again just um figure out with the range tool the amount of time between the selected range so let's say it's 45 um so and since i still have that selected 
um, and then say, okay, I want to take selected audio and then uh, subtract 45, or I could take this one and add 45 samples. And now just kind of come over here, hit apply. And now as we zoom in, we'll see that those will be pretty dead on. So, so give that a shot. All right, um, so we see just a question. Uh, let me describe a scenario to see if we can find some workarounds to assign it to a key command. Uh, I have two tracks with events. Uh, let's say track one has these events naming one, three, five, seven. Track two has these events naming two, four, six, eight. We want to combine the two tracks into one that will have all the events in the order that they were one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Uh, it doesn't matter whether they are snapped or not. Is this possible in Cubase? All right, so I kind of created a scenario, a project based upon the uh, picture that was sent. All right, so let me just. Okay, so we have it here. All right, so let's say we have. Um, this is events um, one, three, five, seven, two, four, six, eight. Um, and I think what he wants to do is to take each of these events um, and from the picture, it looked like he just wanted to have them separated and put onto a single track. Okay, so I created a macro. I was playing with this before the live stream started today. Um, so let's come over and take a look at the macro I created to do this. So, and I'm starting with the top track selected and kind of almost a file that was, um, you know, like a, an, a track that was like a container track. So, but the top one is selected. So I called it like CCLS, uh, merge two tracks. So the macro I created, and you know, you could pause this to enter it in if it does what you want. Is to basically I wanted to um, select all the events on this track. So I'm going to start with the top track selected. Um, then I wanted to copy, and then I'm going to choose where to select no events. Navigate down two tracks, paste, then navigate up to the second track to select all of the track, to select all on this track, copy it, navigate down, uh, paste at origin, and then I'm gonna select all of those events on that track. And then I'm gonna, uh, under edit, there's um, a set spacer between selected events. So if I do this correct, this will move all these down to the, to this empty track. And then we could set a, an amount of time, like one second between each of the tracks. So let's see if it works. So we'll come over to edit to macros. And we'll say CC uh, merge, CCLS, or Club Keybase Livestream, merge two tracks to one track and add space. So we do this. Um, so at this point, we can say, let's add one second of space. And now it's taken all of those. And if I wanted to get rid of the events that were there, I could, instead of copy, I could just cut. And then that would place them down onto my one track laid out for me here. So again, uh, to look at the macro. So we'll go to macro to key commands. Uh, we'll get to CCLS, merge uh, two tracks to one and add space. So if I didn't want the original ones there, um, I could, you know, cut instead of copy, but I'll leave them there just to kind of show. So again, select all on tracks, copy, select none, navigate down two tracks, paste those events, go up one track, select all on the tracks, copy, navigate down, paste, select all those events, and then open up to set spacer between the values. So 
And again, the top track is selected, and this is kind of using three tracks at once. So we come over here, go to the macro, and again, uh, merge, and then set our one second of space, and then everything is in order. Uh, and this is kind of retaining the same track order as before. So I don't know of a way to, if you needed to flip them around, um, you know, and if we have this set into shuffle mode, like let's say for some reason, you know, uh, six came after seven, you could just take seven now and then flip it once you're in shuffle mode. Uh, and then you're able to, at that point, um, change the order if needed. But if you're in shuffle mode here, I could just take six and place it before seven and then uh, change it back to grid and move that around. So let me know if that's helpful and, you know. All right, so I think that's all of the questions that were mailed in. Thank you for sending questions in advance. And let's go back to our live questions here. Okay. All right, so we see a uh, question from Esteban Carlos Benson. Um, can you recommend ways to organize Cubase project files? Example, I have too many draft projects in one folder. If I delete them, Will that delete the audio? So deleting the project file, you know, so if you started off your project and went to file and let's get to new project and you put, you know, you did the prompt for project location and you created a unique folder for each project. Um, then at that point, we'll just open up project here to show you. So let's go to um, documents. And let's get projects. So let's say uh, I'm all right. So let's say we go to this, um, and here I may have um, like two two files. I have two different project files. These project files are accessing the audio in the same folder. So if I say, okay, I want it to delete this project. It's not going, if I delete the project file, it's not going to delete the audio folder. So it's only going to delete that particular project file. So the audio folder will remain intact and all the audio that was recorded from various projects at this location, at this folder level or hierarchy, um, all those files will still be in your audio folder. Now, if you have file audio files that are kind of scattered all over the place and maybe you weren't as diligent with file management, all you would have to do is come over to um, go to your file menu and just choose backup project. Here it's going to ask you for a new folder and at this point you want to create a brand new unique folder. So we'll come over here um, and then it's going to ask you, okay, what's the project name? So you can say this is, you know, May 12, 2023 back up or archive. All right. You can keep the current project open. You could minimize audio files and that means if you had a three minute recording that you used six seconds of, that you're not going to back up to two minutes and 54 seconds of the audio file that was not used. You could also make the direct offline processing permanent. You can remove unused files. You don't have to back up the video. Um, and there's also, you could include or exclude the mix down folder. So once you do that, then everything will be archived directly into that new folder. And that could help clean up um, and then play that new folder. Make sure everything is there as you expect. 
then you could delete all the other folders that are kind of maybe scattered all over the place if needed. All right, thanks again for all great questions. Um, okay, I see that Nick and Peter are actively looking for the Guy Mitchell Moore video, see what he was doing with recording. All right, so we see from uh, Braxel says, uh, sorry, Greg, maybe I could explain better. Uh, if you make a bus in the Audio Connects output example, sometimes they go in front of the stereo bus on the far right. I want the stereo bus on the left. Okay, so let's say, uh, so I think I understand what you're doing now. Um, so I think that these will show up in the order. So, um, so let's go to our audio connections. Um, so let's say if I go to outputs, um, so let's say I remove my output here. Um, so let's say I have my stereo out. And now let me add a bus. And I'll make it, you know, we'll call it Braxel. All right, so now we can see that it's gonna, since we added this bus after the stereo out, that, um, you know, so let's go ahead and add another bus and we'll call it out three. So this is gonna show up in the order that we see in our outputs here. So we have our stereo out, uh, the Braxel out three. And let's say if we are showing our input outputs, um, So, and so that's how you could change. So it would, it's just going to reflect the order of the outputs, you know, that we see in the output tab. So let me know if that makes more sense. All right, so we see a question uh, from Travel Launch. Uh, how to make samples fix to timing of your project and changing key of the sample with different algorithms? Okay, so let's, um, I think I just recently did a tutorial on this. Let me just see if I could open up a particular file here. Just see if I have this. All right, so I'll just build one here quickly. All right. All right, so if we have our tracks kind of set in musical mode, so let me just, uh, so let's say I want to just kind of build uh, a basic production here. All right, so let's turn this up a little so we can hear it better. All right, so let's say I want to now. All right, so I have this particular drum loop. So if I want this drum loop to match my project tempo, so let's say I could just place it into musical mode. So as we play this, um, I could say now I want my tempo to be 108. And if it's not in musical mode, it's gonna play back. 
kind of at the original tempo, but if once it's in musical mode. Now let's say I wanted to add um, like a, a bass part. So I will come over. Um, okay, so let's say, okay, now I want to find bass. So now that it's in, um, so if once it's in musical mode, um, and generally if you've kind of previewed uh, stuff, it will show up in musical mode. So I come here and... Now so I want to find a keyboard part. It's not very exciting. Let's look for um, maybe synth, synth lead. Okay, so I want to drag this in. All right, now probably the bass won't work musically, harmonically with... So maybe those don't work as But when we actually look at samples, we could have something if we wanted these to kind of match harmonically. And let's say let's throw that in and I want to copy these over All right, so what we could do is, you know, we'll have, you know, what we call a project root key. Mm. So if we wanted to come over here, we could go to the settings and make sure that project root key is enabled and it'll be this little icon. So anything, any of the loops that comes with Cubase will, in most third party loops will have a root key. So I could now come over here and just say, okay, I want to sneak key of E. So drums that don't have kind of a harmonic, you know, don't have a root key won't change. But I could just say, like I want this to be in the key of G now. And my bass and synth part will automatically transpose up to match the pro project root key. Singer is not feeling that particular key. You could just come over here. The drums don't change pitch, but the harmonic contents will transpose up. But once everything is in musical mode, and then you make sure that you have the project root key, then you could set that, and then your loops will fit rhythmically, they'll fit in time, and then the loops that have audio uh, kind of harmonic content, you know, that will determine like, you know, different pitches that could clash, could automatically follow the project root key directly there. Okay, Jose asks, uh, hello Greg, can you show what needs to be done uh, in other, maybe in order to prepare an audio clip to be used as a sample loop? Example, embedded tempo, key in the case of melodic, etc. All right, so let's say I have a, I'll just render a loop from Groove Agent. All right, so let's say we're 108. I'm gonna add an instrument track here, so let's do Groove Agent. All right, so, you know, one of the cool things is that as you 
uh, have files, and if you record files in Cubase, it's automatically going to do the um, the tagging, the the tempo tagging for you. So let me just come over here. We'll just load quick kit. I'm going to drag a pattern out. Okay, so now I'm going to take this pattern and let's render it in place. Okay, so I'm going to go to my render settings. Let's give it a custom name. GA cool loop. And often people will put in the tempo in the name. All right, uh, and let's go ahead and let's render that. Okay. All right, so now we have the audio file directly here. Okay, so at this point, when we go into our pool window, so uh, just command or control plus the letter P, we'll see our cool. And then at this point, we see that it's 108 BPM. So as we rendered the file, that was automatically included in it. And let's say if we want to set um, like our project root key, and at this point, all you have to do is say, okay, this, if it was a, like a base part, we can say, okay, this is the root key directly there. And at that point, you could also come to, let's, you know, come to embed it um, in Media Bay. So you could come over to Media Bay. And let's say if I wanted to just go home here. So let's say I just wanted to. Uh, go to my file browser and let's go to projects. All right. All right, so now let's say we go into our audio folder and I wanted to now um, you know, one of the cool things you could do is, and I'll, it's a little, I'll show you on the bigger media bay, but you could, at this point, when you go to our media bay, any audio file uh, that is selected, so I'll just come over here, projects again. that at this point we could see uh, directly over here and then we could, um, you know, we could include kind of our different, so we could see our root key should be indicated um, as one of the categories. So you could just come um, directly over here and set the root key in Media Bay. So as soon as I wanted to um, we can say follows tempo signature key. So at this point we can say, okay, my key is going to be, uh, in C. So you could uh, assign that metadata directly inside of media bay as well. So give that a shot. Okay. Okay, so we see um from Saragos, just says last time I contact support uh, team is ridiculous. All the plugins like EQ, compression, and so forth were just out. Uh, with the pro, we found out why it was just record delay compensation. So yeah, if you have the uh, direct, you know, if you have the you know uh, constrained delay compensation on um, at that point. 
that will bypass particular plugins. It's a pretty common question we get here in the live streams as well. So sorry if support, um, not sure which support team uh, wasn't able to help with that. So, but they may not have been able to see your particular project. All right. See, Jazz Dude says, uh, if YouTube finds out how to monetize all the free tutorial content, they're going to do it and share with content creators. Uh, keep that in mind and save the best tutorials now. So it used to be I didn't have to specifically choose not to monetize the live streams. But every time I create a live stream now, I have to specifically say. So I have a feeling that even if uh, they didn't uh, monetize it, that they may not share it with the creators. So. All right, so a uh, feature request, please, from uh, Jean-Pierre Pianists. Um, dragging over mute in the arrange window should mute all track as we continue dragging. For now, it's it's uh, the best way to mute multiple tracks in a large session. Um, so I'm not sure if you're just doing like that, but that will mute multiple events. So if you just come if you're doing it on the events i'm not sure if you're doing it on the track level or just in the events but you know you could do just a multiple selection like so just to kind of toggle particular events to mute and unmute um but i'm not sure if you want to do it kind of at the track level as well you know i mean generally the tools don't work there All right, great to see Johnny D on. Okay, so it looks like uh, maybe Nick found out that it was just the step input that was used. All right, Sable Winters asks, uh, Greg, I picked up a second new dongle. Um, existing one's been returning random LCC2 error messages. Uh, would moving e-licensor products over to replacement uh, create more problems or render the first one useless? So once you kind of transfer the license and you can do that in the e-licensor just by dragging it over, um, the license will just move from one uh, from one machine from one e licensor to the other. So, um, and then once that license is off the first e licensor, you know, then it's not going to be holding a license. So I'm not sure if it's useless, but it won't be storing and doing license management for you. All right, wonderful to see David M, who's made it in from Liverpool. Thanks for thanks for joining us today. Hope you're doing well, buddy. All right, uh, Mike Reinhardt asks, uh, hi Greg, happy Friday. Uh, I have acid loops with acidized wave files. Will they auto map to tempo and key of the Cubase project or do they need adjusting after import? So I think as long as you, as you drag them in, if it's um, set to uh, autoplay, uh, align beats to project, let me just check this, that it will be kind of, played in musical mode so let's say um, as I drag in a loop here and while with that's turned on that musical mode is turned on but if this is not turned on that um, maybe it's this one So I, but I think it will read the metadata, but if, if it doesn't just simply select it and just turn on musical mode for all of the acidized files that you dropped in. All 
All right, so we see uh, Pylon Records. Uh, does Cubase have any tools to send CV out to via audio interface? It has ADAT. Uh, is there native Cubase plugin to generate control voltage to Eurorack gear? Thank you. So I don't think that there's a native plugin to do it, but I think it's really just the audio that's being sent out um, you know, to the audio interface. But it's really the important thing is that the audio interface has DC coupled outputs. Uh, so without that, the CV won't work. So it doesn't, uh, it's not really so much a function of Cubase, but it's really more a function of the audio interface and if it has DC coupled outputs. All right. Um, so Gareth asks, um, uh, just a general question, which products are now post e-licensor? So which ones are on the Steinberg licensing? So I think there's actually a website up. So, a, you know, a, good majority of them are so let's go ahead and just take a quick look um so just google steinberg licensing product list so the list of software requiring relying on steinberg um so just a help center article. All right, so we can see the Absolute Collection 6, Backbone 1.5, Cubase, all the 12, Dorka Pro, Groove Agent 5.1.1, Hallion 7. So we can see all these have migrated over all the different sound contents. This is a lot of work to get all these over. So that's will give you an idea. So if you just Google uh, software relying on Steinberg licensing into Google, it should come up pretty quickly. So I just Googled Steinberg licensing product list. So, but as you can see, just about all the main titles have migrated over all of the instruments you know all the newer instruments see Garrett just saying two four six eight who do we appreciate Greg so brings back fond memories of eighth grade basketball games and stuff all right all right reading through uh, different questions all right different comments thanks for all the great questions and comments from everyone All right, wonderful to see uh, Lucy Godfrey on. She says hi to Greg Super Undo. Yeah. My wife's not that impressed with the live stream, so. But thank you, glad to see that you made it. All right. Um, so we see uh, from Louis Che, uh, hello again, Greg. When I start a new project and import all the files, I want the bars in the grid to line up with the bars of audio. So bar one aligns with bar one on the grid. Uh, is there a quick way? All right, so let's say um, I wanted to import, so we'll do a new project. All right, so I'm going to just take my timeline to measure one. 
and then let's go ahead and import audio files. Um, so let me just So let's just come over here and let's get to audio. All right, so I'm just going to import a lot of files here. And then it'll ask you, do you want to uh, insert onto one track or to different tracks? I'm going to choose different tracks. And now it imported them all starting at measure one, beat one. So let me know if that's what you want to do, Lewis. All right, uh, so you see Peter just asking. Um, I have a JL Cooper CS10-2. Not sure if anyone's familiar with the device. It's been sitting in its box forever, it seems. Is there anything useful that it might use with it for? So, you know, if it's transmitting MIDI data, you could definitely hook it up for a MIDI remote. But let me just check. Um, we come to devices. Um, so you could still, you know, just come if you click on the plus sign here. Uh, so I think it's you said it's a CS10. So you know, there's there is kind of a whole device panel for it uh, inside of Cubase that you could configure. Um, so you know, there is support for it inside of Cubase. You know, it's not the most popular controller. You know, I'm not I haven't seen much of JL Cooper stuff. In a while, like my boss that hired me used to work with him at Oberheim. You know, used to work with Jim Cooper. So, but there is support for it in Cubase. But if it's spitting out MIDI, you can make a, you know, it's just additional MIDI buttons that you could use for control functionality in the MIDI remote because that will work with anything. All right, so we see a question. Um, hey, Greg, is there any advantage to recording in 32-bit mode? Um, so some audio interfaces like the Steinberg AXR, the Steinberg URC interfaces will record in, you know, instead of just being, you know, the vast majority of audio interfaces have 24-bit converters. The AXR and the Steinberg AXR and Steinberg URC interfaces all have 32-bit integer converters, so you could record at 32-bit and you can capture more data and it does sound better. Um, when recording in, if you have a 24-bit interface, why do you want to record in 32-bit floating point? When can that be helpful is when you go to the input channels, let's say, okay, I'm recording and I want to apply plugins because probably as you're recording, you're capturing a full 24-bit word. And then if you say, okay, I want to have a, you know, tube compressor on the input stage, uh, we could now record the 24-bit word, have the extra room, the extra information within the 32-bit floating point file for accommodating all the extra information that's going to be embedded from the compressor on the way in so that we're not truncating the 24-bit audio file to include that. So if you're recording with plugins and your converters are 24-bit, um, at that point you could capture the audio, run it through plugins, and not degrade the original quality and enhance it through plugins on the way in by capturing a 32-bit floating point file. So that's when it gets to be uh, for recording when it makes a big difference. And obviously when you export, you know, doing it 32 bit will capture more, will contain more information for you. All right, Braxel asks, uh, Greg, so if there is a bus in front of the stereo bus on top in audio connections, 
Uh, you should remove, remove those buses so they are below the stereo bus. Does that work the same for input buses? So yeah, the input buses will follow the order of what we see in the audio connections. So if you wanted to you know, change the order of that, then, and I think even if we come over here, let's add, let's say is a, a stereo bus here and let's add um, another stereo bus. And let's see if I select this and add a bus. Uh, it goes directly to the bottom. So yeah, so it's gonna follow this order of how the inputs were or and outputs were populated and that will follow the order that will dictate the order that is applied to the particular files as they're laid out in the mix console. <laughs> Nick just says uh Note the use of very professional words, MIDI thingy. I think just referring to the JL Cooper CS10. So, but yeah, you should definitely, it's definitely usable still. Yeah, so Peter is just saying, uh, Nick already used my, that he uses his Tascam DM4800 as a control surface. Uh, perhaps it could be used for a velocity expression. Uh, orchestral with orchestral type instruments so you could definitely do that just assign the particular MIDI CC for the faders so it always seems like you can't have enough little MIDI fader boxes in, in the heat of battle of a project All right, so we see from Sable Winters, uh, Greg will cross grade from will cross grade from uh, Isotope RX six to standard uh, RX six standard to Spectral Design Pro. How does that work? Um, all right, let me just take a look and see. I think you generally just have to uh, email proof of ownership of the competitive product. Um, And Spectralayers is on sale. All right, so let's see if they give any indications here. So let's say we want to go nine and So it looks like maybe it's um, competitive cross grade. Yeah, so it looks like you get the full uh, from Isotope RX5 and higher. So um, probably if you just go here, you may have to send a screenshot or an image of of uh, like, you know, that you have, um, or maybe even your uh, Isotope account, something like that. So let's see if we go to add to cart. Um, so let's see if we proceed to check out, it may ask for But probably at this point, just um, I think if you just kind of send a particular screenshot that that would suffice. If you run into problems, Sable, just let me know. Um, and I could always kind of make sure it gets through for you. See so Gareth saying spectral is great stuff. He killed a load of big noise with it. All right. All right, wonderful to see Pablo on from Galicia, España. So and I was thinking of Gareth as well, because I heard somewhere some some reference to Bilbao, Spain. Uh maybe in a book I was reading or something. 
but wonderful to see Pablo on the live stream. Everyone's happy when Pablo's on. The full hot mess contingent uh, is present today. All right. Pablo's dancing at the tour bus. It's the lonely life of a rock star. All right, so we see Benny from Sweden has made it back, so glad you can make it back in time before we wrap up. Pablo, as a drummer, says he loves Groove Agent. He uh, doesn't need his drums anymore, so that's good. We can't replace Pablo, though. All right, so Gareth saying, uh, Project Root Key and Audio Pool is a revelation of the day, so... Pablo's asking if, if that's his new tune. So you could use that as the basis for a song, Gareth. I give you permission. All right, sorry. Um... All right, so we see from uh, Ear to Soul. Uh, hey, Greg, in Cubase Pro, is there a way to link automation information, say volume automation, to its audio clip so that when you move the audio clip, the automation will follow the clip? Thanks. <clears throat> yeah, so we'll show you. It's usually on by default. Uh, so let's say in this clip here, I have automation. And if you go to the edit menu, you'll see automation follows events. So make sure that that is checked. And now once you move the automation or move the event, the automation is coupled and tied to it. And it's gonna be at the track level. So if I turn that off and uncheck it, I move the event and it's the automation stayed where it was. Uh, so again, edit, just check automation follows events. And then you can be do it just that easily. Because you say, well, saying, uh, click heels together times three, repeating in, in sync musical mode. That'll do it. So. All right. Peter asks, uh, is it possible to select, slash, select uh, slash highlight a specific track from the track list and have its associated events and parts highlighted as well? Okay. So, um, there is a function. So let's say if I have um, this repeated a couple of times. So let's say I just wanted to come here. Um, if you go to edit menu, so let's say I have this track selected here and I have, you know, eight events or so. Uh, I could go to edit. And then you can go to select and there's a keyboard shortcut you could assign for this. So you could say select all unselected tracks and then you could select everything on that particular track. Um, another way you could do it is, you know, if the track is selected, if you just hold down a shift key and double click on the first event, that will select all subsequent track, all following events on that particular track. So shift, double click or just select the event here or select the track and go to edit, select all unselected tracks. I used that in the macro previously. Um, so let me know if that would be helpful for you, Peter. All right, so we see uh, Dowski just says, uh, Hi, Greg, I have two folders with samples. I'd like to see them as one when I search uh, Media Bay. Um, so you can just, you know, it, let's say uh, I go to, um, you know, it, you could, you know, it's going to maintain kind of the, the folder structure that you have in your computer. But let's say if I'm going to Loops, 
um, or I just wanted to come over here to my file browser um, and I go to projects. So projects has obviously lots of audio files in and subfolders. So number of subfolders, so maybe, you know, a thousand folders in this. And I just type in base. This will find everything, you know, in the particular, everything that's in all of my different folders for me here. So if I say, oh, I want to go into this folder and look at base, I could do that. Um, so, you know, but so if you just, you know, do a search for particular files in the file browser and just kind of type in the name or like a searchable criteria here, it will do everything in all subfolders for you automatically. So it doesn't matter if your samples are in two folders, um, you know, so you could find it that way as well. So, so let me know if that's helpful. All right, so you see Sable Winters just says thanks regarding the e-licensor, probably with the list. Oh, with the, the e-licensor for transferring, so. All right, so Sable Winters just says, uh, I hear T guitars is amazing. Is it true? It is pretty amazing. And also the M guitar, so the T guitar, I think my speculation would be that it's a Taylor guitar and the M guitar would be a Martin. So, but it gives you the ability to, um, you know, to trigger... Uh, we'll take, see if we can take a quick look at it here. It says add um, quick instrument. So not only is it like, you know, painstakingly sampled uh, for every single individual note, but there's all sorts of great um, like strumming patterns that you could access as well. So we'll come over here. So there's only really one preset that you kind of work with. Um, I haven't used this as much recently, but let's say if I'm here. Um, so if I play a chord, so I can go. So these notes would do, so whatever chord I play here. So if I play D minor chord, so this is like a down stroke, up stroke. And then I could play so you could kind of like play the chord or even have it with the chord track. And then where it gets really interesting is when you get into working with patterns, because then you could say, um, now I wanted to come over here and we could say, okay, for each one of these, I want it maybe like a funk pattern on C1. If you want it to be, you know, maybe a, um, let's say just a, maybe like a, even a folk pattern. So you can come over here. And if you want it to be finger style or pick. So you could kind of set up all these, uh, you know, different patterns to kind of work from. Um, so all sorts of great stuff. So if you want to build kind of virtual guitar tracks for backing, it's really ideal for that. Okay. Respond to my wife real quick. All 
All right. Okay, so uh, Romain just says, uh, found the cause of his issue with the render place and groove agent with multiple outputs of MIDI. I need to drag and drop my MIDI event in a pattern pad at first. Yeah, so it, then, you yeah, know, generally it's going to yeah, require the pattern to work with. All right, so we see value has to take off. So thanks for joining us today, and we'll look forward to seeing you on Tuesday. through comments thanks for all the great comments and Garrett says everyone should rub the like button and that I get a tickle for every single like so so Peter is just saying uh, I was hoping to select track and all events in one fell swoop uh, I could get used to a second step in a form of macro or key command. Yeah, I don't think there's a preference to select tracks uh, following event selection, but, you know, there, there could be a lot of consequences of doing this and selecting all the events uh, by default uh, for editing tasks. Um, but I'll just look one more time just to make sure that there's um, isn't one I'm so we have the track selection falls event selection um yes yeah, so I think it's safer there's a there could be a lot of unwanted consequences of selecting this in the tracks you know so I think it's pretty good uh you know shift double click on the first event or just having a key command for the you could use your jail cooper cs10 to fire off the the function to select all all events on a selected track Okay, so uh, Luis asks, um, Greg, regarding uh, my previous uh, question, uh, the audio files I import do not start right at beat one. Let's say there's some silence at the beginning. Okay, um, so let's say if you have, let me just, um, Okay, so let's say I have these two events and I'm gonna bounce, just gonna bounce, uh, render these. I'll show you a trick that you could do. Um, so we'll bounce this selection here. So let, let's say, just, Okay, so let me just create a scenario with some silence. Or I'll just I'll just go to. A, I'm sure I have a file here that has silence at the beginning. Okay, so let's say maybe um, like the drums in this project are silent uh, at the beginning. Um, one of the things you could do is like you know as you go into uh, a particular file, you know, you could come over to audio to advanced, um, and so it's got audio advanced and should be detect silence should Just gonna revert to this. OK, 
Okay, so if you wanted to eradicate the silence, try going to uh, detect silence, and then you could, you know, just uh, analyze and, you know, process to get rid of the silent parts. Uh, if you wanted to do that, another method, uh, maybe just to, let's say, where the file starts is you come here, we go to um, show events, and then you can move the snap point to the cursor. And now you could just, instead of like the beginning of the silence, instead of that snapping, we could just say, okay, I want to snap to bar. Now it's going to be this particular snap point. Um, so if you do it on... Like, you know, every single track we see this line and then the beginning of the file isn't what is snapping. It's where this particular snap point is. So again, uh, choose this to show events or clips and events and you can move the snap position or like the sync point. And then you could synchronize based on that as opposed to the beginning. But I realize you may have to do that uh, for each of the files, but it, you may save a lot of time in the long run doing with that approach. Gareth is referred to me as Andres Gregovia. So it's good. I'll, I'll take that as a badge of honor from someone living in Spain. All right. Uh, so we see, I uh, wonder if I sent my guitar through a keyboard MIDI to Cubase, it would work. Uh, Cubase T guitar. So if you have, um, you know, if you have a MIDI, you could you could play the individual notes on the on the T guitar. Uh, if you have a, a MIDI guitar, so you know, if you if you have a MIDI guitar, you could definitely play and have access to uh, you know to T guitar. And so, but if you don't have a MIDI guitar, uh, you know, you're probably faster playing it from a keyboard than trying to make your guitar recording automatically uh, make it work. All right, so we see Peter from Montreal to take off. Uh, so thanks for joining us today, and we'll see you on Tuesday. All right, so we see Spike Williams eventually got his Iconica download, took 12 hours, so you would just appreciate it more now that, you know, it took you so long to actually get it once you purchased it. So, but, um, but we're glad that you're like in T guitar and hope you're liking Iconica. It's a wonderful library. All right. Peter wanted to wish a uh, happy mother's day to all the moms that may be watching. So it's a great, it's a great sentiment to pass on. Hope that everyone's able to have a nice day of celebration. All right, so Charles Ferraro asked, uh, hi, Greg, how are you? How's the fam? So we're all doing wonderfully well. So uh, I have to go meet my son. He's doing an orchestral rehearsal today. So for his fourth grade orchestra, he's really doing well. So looking forward to a nice weekend and celebrating Mother's Day. And we see that uh, Mother's Day is in June in the UK. So... All right, so Michael Teams uh, just says, uh, Sable Winters, uh, is, she says, I guess from Michael Teams, was wondering, some guitar processors do have MIDI outs, was wondering about guitar into keyboard. Yeah, so a lot of times the, the processors are kind of intended to capture program changes, like to switch different sounds for different parts of the songs, but they don't convert your guitar into MIDI, most of them. Some may. Uh, but, you know, check out, um, you know, but there are, there are some really good MIDI guitar stuff now. All 
All right, so I think I'm at the end of questions, and we got all the questions that were mailed in. We'll see if there's any other questions that sneak in. If not, we'll wrap up a little early. Thank you for all the wonderful questions. I hope that everyone has learned a tip or trick, and if you've learned something new, make sure that you actually hit the like button uh, and subscribe to the channel if you haven't done that. All right, um, so we see Mandala Man asks, uh, Hi Greg, I hope you're doing well. I was wondering if there is a way to freeze multiple tracks simultaneously in Cubase 11. Thank you. So I think it came in Cubase 11 uh, after the very first uh, rendition of like 11.1. .1. So if you come over to, I think it was added in 11.1. Uh, .1. So if we go to, I think it's under maybe edit, uh, freeze, unfreeze. So you can say freeze selected tracks. Um, and then we could just come over and you could just freeze your selected tracks and select multiple tracks. And that will just go through one by one. So you don't have to do it each track singly. And that's all you have to do. So just go to edit and then go to uh, freeze, unfreeze. And you could just do that with, um, you know, multiple tracks. So now these are all frozen, as we could see indicated right there. So we'll delete our freeze files. And we could do that for multiply selected tracks in freeze and unfreeze. All right, so we see Sable Winter says she has a guitar, is not actually a competent player, T guitar to the rescue. All right. Um, all right. So we see Charles Ferraro asks uh, how he does wavetable, granular, FM. Yes, so it does all those plus uh, tone, like organ oscillator it also does virtual analog and sampling and you combine you can combine all of those together in one single patch which is what makes it really pretty amazing all right so we see best cream jesus just says thank you greg thank you for being on and we and we appreciate you being on the live streams all right so uh t guitar versus m guitar personal preference or different sounding so you know if there's uh, you know, Martin guitars have a long legacy in the industry. Taylor guitars is kind of a more modern acoustic guitar company. Um, you know, people love both brands, uh, passionately and people will have both Martins and Taylors for different flavors. Everyone loves their Taylors. Everyone loves their Martins. You know, it's kind of, uh, two great bottles of wine, two great bottle, you know, two great violins, slightly different flavors um but you know you could listen to some of the different sound examples and check it out all right we see gerald ely's going back to his transfer good luck on uh on getting your new system set up that's always exciting all right Wonderful to see Graham Witcher from Royal B Wooten Bassett. Uh, he wishes everyone a great weekend and everyone's making wonderful music with Cubase. Uh, best DAW in the world. Great. All right. Let me see John Koskin saying thank you to everyone. All right, we'll see if there's any more questions that sneak in. If not, we'll wrap up a little bit early. Given our 20 seconds, usually I'm 20, 30 seconds ahead from when I speak to when you guys hear me. Right, 
Let's see if there's waiting our 10 more seconds and then we'll wrap up. All right, so we see a quick question. Uh, best way to bring a track from another session into present session? You know, one way is if you want just like the media, you know, just drag, you know, just drag and drop. Uh, if you want it settings for it, uh, you know, you could copy and paste. You could also come over to file and import tracks from project and just come over here and you can see all of your different tracks uh, laid out for you right here and then you could just say import that you could import the events and parts or if you just wanted the channel and inspector settings or if you didn't want automation then you could import tracks from other projects and directly you know and you could choose where to be at the absolute position at the relative position or at the cursor position All right, so with that, I guess we're just about out of questions. So thanks everyone. Thanks for spending uh, part of your weekend, part of your Friday morning, evening, afternoon with us. Uh, we hope everyone's learned some new tricks and look forward to being back on Tuesday. Um, my password shouldn't lock me out of my computer. So looking forward to getting back on our normal Tuesday and Friday schedule. Everyone, please have a wonderful weekend. Stay safe and healthy. And we'll see everyone back on Tuesday. Thank you very much and have a great day.